With elections set for September 20th, all the parties are laying down their agendas. The parties want to come up and talk about the current issues and how they would have done it differently. Today, to discuss this and more, we have with us Garnet Jenis, who's the Conservative Member of Parliament from Edmonton. Welcome, Garnet. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Uh, Garnet, uh, as I said, you know, with the elections, everybody wants to hear more about politics, more about mm -hmm. agendas, more about what parties are uh, offering, um, be it liberal, conservative, or your party. Um, the first question which comes to my mind is, and what's your take on that? That's what we like to understand. The first question is that the Afghanistan, the Taliban takeover yes. on Afghanistan, um, what is like Canada's reactions? And you have served as a shadow minister for uh, human rights mm -hmm. um, earlier. So y tell, us, tell us something more about yeah. that. Well, it's a, it's a very sad situation on many different levels. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are the, the people impacted. Uh, I think of our veterans who, who sacrifice so much. Uh, in the context of, of that and are, are watching uh, the undoing of, of much of their work. Uh, and there's also major uh, security implications mm -hmm. uh, for us going forward. Um, it, to t take this back a little bit, so sure. um, six years ago I was first elected as a, as a parliamentarian and one of the first issues I took on was the rights of minority communities in Afghanistan. In fact, the first statement I made in Parliament was about the situation of the Sikh and Hindu minority in Afghanistan. A uh, compelling situation where you had a relatively small community. The, those in Canada were ready to provide funding for private sponsorship, but the government was not willing to create a, a special program, if you like, a mechanism by which people could be sponsored directly from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And that was six years ago I made that statement. I've tabled many petitions on it since. The government has still not acted at any point uh, to allow those from mi minority communities. So, um, you know, and then w w more recently, in the last few months, there's been a, a heightened attention on the issue of interpreters, those who uh, were working with sure. Canada, Canadian media organizations and others. Uh, help, how do we help those people come to Canada now that they are going to be particularly vulnerable uh, in the context of, of what did happen, which was a Taliban takeover. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been calling regularly on the government to act to help people in that situation. So um, you know, the, what, what Canada needed to do here was act early to help those who were, who were in highly vulnerable situations uh, receive that sponsorship they need to come to Canada. Uh, the government was unwilling to act. They dragged their feet. And then two weeks ago, the Prime Minister, on, on, on the same day that Kabul was falling, instead of being fully focused, fully engaged in that issue, he was calling an election. He was going to the Governor General. You know, we mm -hmm. have wildfires in BC. We have, um, you know, we have the fourth wave of, of uh, COVID. But yeah, yep. And we have the situation in Afghanistan. And instead, the Prime Minister's focus has been on politics instead of on the public interest. And I think um, that has really disappointed a lot of people. Uh, we, we should have been acting much earlier on, on uh, helping support refugees coming out of Afghanistan. Now, the Prime Minister made a political announcement at the last minute saying, we're going to take a certain number of refugees. But if you read the fine print on that announcement, uh, that was an announcement actually for Afghan nationals who were already outside of Afghanistan. And there have been huge delays in that as well. I mean, there have been, there've been uh, Afghan Sikhs in India, for example, that people mm -hmm. have been trying to sponsor. There have been, been years-long delays in sure. actually processing those. Um, but, but even there, that's not the most vulnerable group of people right now. The most vulnerable people, group of people are those in Afghanistan who, who need to be evacuated. So, so it's, it's been a, a significant failure on the part of the government. Uh, the, and, the, government the government has not acted, despite being asked to act, by opposition politicians like myself for mm -hmm. years. And their focus now is not on the crisis, it's on their own political interests, on having an election that we didn't need to have. Sure. Uh, as you just mentioned that, um, you know, Mr. Prime Minister did announce, uh, you know, had issued a statement where they were accepting refugees and they did take that step. Um, so how was there a delay in that whole procedure and how do you see that the government's failing because there are procedures involved, um, there are policies that are involved which need to be followed. So yeah. um, there were refugees who were brought in in the country as well. Well, they made an announcement uh, two days before the election, uh, two days before the fall of, of, of Kabul. Sure. And that announcement was to receive a certain number of refugees who are already in third countries. Uh, 
so it doesn't apply to people who are in Afghanistan. Right. Um, what we had been calling for, in fact, going back six years, what we called for mm -hmm. was a special program to allow direct sponsorship of vulnerable refugees from Afghanistan to be able to come directly to Canada. Sure. So we're not telling people they have to make that journey to a, to a third country. And, you know, they're, they're, they're throwing out this political announcement basically just as the door is already closing. Sure. Because uh, people are now going to have a really hard time uh, getting to a third country, getting even to the airport now. Um, you know, and, and hopefully, from our perspective, we're successful in this election. We're able to put uh, Canadian leadership on the world stage on, on a strong footing again with a conservative government. Um, but the failure of the government up till now will, will make it very difficult to, to help people that are now already in, in a very dangerous situation. So let me ask you, Garnet, uh, what would your party, which is a conservative party, mm -hmm had done it differently uh, yeah. in a situation like this? Well, in 2015, we, uh, in fact, in the election, we committed to a special program to allow that s private sponsorship for uh, the religious minority communities in Afghanistan. We had been calling for months ahead of, of this point in time uh, for support for interpreters. So we, we would have been ready. We would have moved quickly. We would have put in place programs years ago to allow that direct sponsorship from from uh, vulnerable communities, so these are these are some of the things that we committed to, we talked about, we were talking about continuously, uh, and uh, unfortunately, the government didn't listen to us and didn't act. Um, you know, I, I think as well, there at this point, there there's a lot of legitimate skepticism about the government's just ability to deliver, ability to act. With, with COVID-19, they said, well, it's a big surprise. No one expected this, right? With, mm -hmm. with what happened in Afghanistan, oh, big surprise. No one expected this. Well, we expect competent government to plan for the future, to prepare for those kinds of um, contingencies that could happen. A proactive happen. government than a exactly. reactive government. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And, and when, it come, when it comes to refugees, I mean, you, there, very often there's warning signs, right? Very often the um, uh, persecution of minority communities, it doesn't, it doesn't usually uh, go to the sort of extreme from zero right away. There's a process of, of demonization and of, of mm -hmm. escalating violence. And we've seen that process unfold. Sure. Uh, in Afghanistan, e even even uh, long prior to the the takeover by the Taliban, uh, we were seeing escalating uh, escalating acts of, of human rights abuse targeting minority communities that needed to be addressed and and was not addressed. Sure, um, you know there's another pressing issue, which is a national issue and of national interest, is the relationship with China. Mm -hmm. um, as we speak about Afghanistan, um, you know there's another country that we. Um, that Canadians have been talking about and the government has been talking about is the relationship with China and mm -hmm. trade with them. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, misconception about what kind of relationship currently China is mm -hmm. sharing with you. Can you talk about it a little bit? Absolutely. Well, uh, let's remember the Liberals came into office uh, promising a, a golden age in terms of relations with China. Clearly, they haven't mm -hmm. uh, delivered on that. And, and part of the reality is that there's been a, a real hardening uh, of uh, you know, human rights abuses, uh, of threats to peace and security coming out of the, the Xi Jinping uh, regime. Sure. And um, look, it's, it's important for, for China as well as for other countries to know where Canada stands. Mm -hmm. And cons conservatives have pushed for a clear, principled stand on human rights. Uh, willing to stand up for human rights, and, and also we've pushed for uh, for stronger measures to protect our own security. One of the big issues to think about in the relationship with with China is, uh, and we see it with other countries as well, foreign state-backed interference in Canada. I think this is the primary threat to Canada's security today, which sure. is the efforts of foreign states directly or through proxies uh, to shape and control the direction of com a conversation in Canada. Sometimes it's through kind of capturing people and, and appealing to them. Sometimes it's through uh, intimidation and, and threats and, and mm -hmm. other you know, direct violence. Um, so we need tougher laws in place to combat that foreign interference. So uh, when a conservative government comes in, we are going to, to undertake some of those measures as, as committed to in our platform to prevent the interference by foreign states and to really protect Canadian sovereignty. Um, we are also going to just be very clear about where we stand on these, mm -hmm. these, these principal issues of human rights. Uh, and that will be the basis then for, for dialogue, a, a clarity of, of principle and position. Uh, what we've seen from the Liberals is, 
is weakness, is inconsistency. Um, we have the, the ongoing case of Canadians arbitrarily detained in China, uh, and there were some real mixed messages that came from the government on that. We need to be clear and principled mm -hmm. uh, in standing up for, for Canadians as well as others that are detained in China. Uh, so this would be our approach. I think it would be a more effective approach and certainly one that's reflective of our values. Sure. Um, uh, Garnet, what I understand when we are at a, at a platform where you know the elections are just nearing and uh, each party is trying to kind of play their agendas and put forward uh, that how would they have done better like mm -hmm. you know um, your party is doing at this point of time um, but how is it like how do you assure people how do you tell people that you know what what we commit will do it because the promises are made each time and they are not delivered be it you know, any party. Mm -hmm. um, and how it, is it going to be different? And then we also talk about the pandemic and the economic so-called depression that yeah. uh, the country has gone into. We'll talk about that as well. But quickly, like, I'd like to yeah. hear on, you know, how are you giving the assurance to people? Well, I, I think uh, it's about trust and it's about building up credibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we've seen in, in uh, two terms of liberal government is a real failure to follow through on commitments. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to remember now going back, but when Trudeau first came in, he said, he said only $10 billion deficits for three years and then a balanced budget. And he blew through that in the first year. We, we ran up over $100 billion of new debt prior to the pandemic. Sure. Um, so, so there have been many cases. He, he promised uh, sunny ways. He promised a, an end to, to the Liberal Party's history of corruption, yet we, we've seen um, scandal after scandal after scandal. Um, so when, when there's been a loss of trust, you know, we would say it's time for a change. And Conservatives have laid out a clear plan. Uh, the first full day of the campaign, in fact, the Monday after the election was called, we released our platform. Mm -hmm. Liberals called an early election. They still haven't come up with a platform. Conservatives, uh, we said now wasn't the time for the election, but we were ready with a full detailed platform. So people can read that. Uh, there's a lot of strong commitments in there around the economic recovery, around strengthening immigration, making the immigration system um, more welcoming, more effective, uh, more responsive. Uh, human rights policies, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, of detail in the platform. Any issue that people have on their minds, you know, mental health, disabilities, indigenous rights, uh, chances are you'll find some detailed commitments and proposals in, in the platform around that. And people can find that conservative.ca slash plan. Now on the economic recovery, mm -hmm. big, big challenge right now. Um, and we want to really emphasize support that promotes economic recovery, which is why um, we, we, we said that with regard to the CERB, there should be reforms that actually support people going back to work instead of of being very punitive on those who choose to go back to work. We pushed for a higher wage subsidy because we said if people are continuing to be connected with their workplace, it makes it much easier for that transition for them to come back into work and for the employer to be able to, to access people and, 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 and reopen. Sure. Uh, we, we have made some further proposals on how to stimulate economic growth coming out of this pandemic, a GST holiday in December. Uh, to really stimulate that that growth, um, a, a, a tax credits to support investment in local uh, businesses. Uh, we've also proposed a, a significant hiring credit that for for six months uh, companies will get a portion of the wages of new hires paid, so encouraging them to hire new people. Sure. Uh, these these kinds of uh, really stimulation uh, stimulative policies economically. Uh, will help our economy get moving again. This is this is the only way for us to, you know, work back to uh, balanced budget, maintain social programs, get 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 everything under control. Is to have the kind of economic growth which is going to fuel opportunity sure. for those who need it. Sure. I just heard GST holiday in December. Yes. Can you expand on that? Absolutely. So uh, we want to encourage economic activity, mm -hmm. and a big part of how we're going to stimulate that is, is a temporary uh, tax holiday. So that uh, and there's some exceptions. You know, if you if you buy, we, we want to encourage people to to make those purchases through local realtors, uh, pardon me, uh, local local businesses, uh, and and so. It, the, the GST holiday is not going to apply if you if you make a purchase on Amazon, let's say, but otherwise sure. for purchases from local businesses, uh, we think that's going to stimulate more purchasing, get people to to be kind of investing back in the economy, mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to create opportunities for um, 
for for various businesses sure. and just, just get, getting things moving again. Yeah. Okay. So that's something which the conservatives offer. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to understand from you about the real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been another pressing yes. issue in um, a country like Canada. Yeah. Um, you know, is this people? Some people are calling it a bubble. Some people are saying, um, you know, that the government has not kept a check. Um, what is it? And yeah. how are you going to tackle that? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I know it's a it's a it's a huge issue in some some particular regions of the country, especially yeah. uh, where it's just kind of sadly become a given that mm -hmm. that um, that even upper middle class people, never mind everybody else, can't can't really afford a a home a housing, without yeah. without at least getting a lot if, if they're able to getting a lot of support from from others in their family. So so what what we are uh, proposing uh, is really to recognize the crisis that the situation is and to quickly move in a number of policy areas. Now one big issue here is supply. Uh, the, the government has not acted sufficiently to stimulate the increase in supply mm -hmm. of real estate. If there's if there's not enough homes for the number of people that are living here, obviously uh, prices are going to go up. So uh, stimulating that supply uh, will mean uh, uh, releasing more federal lands for that sure. construction, putting in place incentives, uh, working with municipalities to incentivize increases in density and tying that to, uh, uh, to, to funding for public transit. Uh, so so we're we're going to you know, bring these the, the stakeholders we need together to create those incentives for the construction of more housing, more uh, more mm -hmm. rental housing as well. Um, y you know, you increase affordability if there's more supply across the board, and that's and that's that's the reality of. of but the, there's a few other issues that we do need to tackle as well, which is uh, which is foreign uh, buyers. It's this is a money laundering, and that's yep. driving up real estate prices as well. Sure. Uh, so we we have. Uh, committed to bring in a, a temporary moratorium on foreign buyers who aren't living in Canada or planning to come to Canada, uh, and that will uh, that will give us time then to dig further into kind of cleaning up some of these these money laundering practices. You know, it's interesting. I hear from from people from different communities, uh, in particular, who who raise concern that uh, Canada is a place where. Uh, corrupt foreign officials, people that are, are involved in expropriation of wealth in other countries are coming and laundering money here. And obviously that, that mm -hmm. hurts uh, everyday Canadians uh, who are just trying to, trying to buy a home. So we sure. need to recognize the situation for the crisis it is. The Liberals have had six years and they haven't been able to address it. Uh, we're prepared to address it quickly get that supply as well as the uh, the money laundering piece uh, sorted out. Sure. Uh, you touched on the immigration policy yeah. as well. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more how the government, uh, if a conservative party comes into power, yeah. how are they going to be changing it or how is it going to be different yeah. than what it is today? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Canada has a, a great history, obviously, of, of uh, welcoming and being enriched by uh, immigrant communities from from all over the world. Uh, I, I think talking to a lot of people who are using the immigration system, sponsoring family members, mm -hmm. uh, bringing uh, employees, uh, you know, trying to help uh, uh, friends and family come uh, for for short term visits. The, these, there's a lot of frustration with the immigration system in terms of of the quality of service it provides, the speed with which it operates. Um, so, you know, our our, our party's belief is that. The immigration system should work efficiently, effectively, in a culturally sensitive way to be very responsive uh, and to and to uh, meet legitimate needs quickly. So uh, we, we've identified a number of policy changes. Uh, a big one is around processing times. So we're gonna we're gonna dramatically speed up processing times. And part of how we're gonna do that mm -hmm. is allow people to pay an expedited processing fee. Uh, so if a person uh, is uh, waiting to bring a spouse to Canada, for example, they they might be willing to spend a little bit extra uh, to expedite that application. And that extra fee, all of that money is gonna go into hiring more capacity. So we're going to be able to expand processing capacity actually at no cost to the taxpayer. Sure. Uh, so some people will be able and want to pay that extra. Employers might say, yeah, I want this employee here right away. We're going to pay extra. We're going to get it done. Um, not everybody will want to pay that expedited mm -hmm. processing fee, but those who, 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 who don't will still be better off because the lines will be shortened. Right? Yeah. We'll be able to expand capacity, shorten lineups, and that will that will mean faster processing time. Pe people mm -hmm. shouldn't have to wait um, you know, wait a year for, for a person they're, they're married to to be able to come to Canada. Uh, that's, I mean, that's just just crazy. Um, we we need to uh, address this issue of a lot of uh, legitimate visitors being 
turned away in terms of visas. Now, part of that is concerns that people will uh, will overstay their visa, and, sure. and we we haven't done a great job in this country of of, uh, of ensuring that people who overstay their visa are are actually uh, are actually sent back appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, and the result of that is that we're refusing visitor visas because mm -hmm. we're not able to enforce the law on the other other side. So I think if we if we address these issues of enforcement, we'll, we'll be able to do a much better job of uh, of uh, just allowing people to come visit for key family events. Sure. We're going to clean up family, we're, we're going to improve the system of family reunification uh, so we don't have, um, it's not based on a lottery anymore, it's, it's a fairer system um, and, and we're, we're going to continue to, to work to improve family reunification. We're also going to extend the tenure of the super visa from two years to five years. Mm -hmm. so that's a, a, a big ask for a lot of people. Yep. Um, so these are, these are concrete improvements. Another issue for newcomers is being able to work when they get here, and we've right. committed to launching a national credential recognition task force mm -hmm. uh, to really uh, engage provinces, engage uh, professional associations and colleges uh, to to address the challenges that exist in credential recognition. Um, I spoke with one of our candidates in Toronto recently who was talking about some of the charity work he'd been involved in um, with uh, with uh, giving out food to people that, that were that were in need, uh, and, and he found it really striking that sometimes they'd have people who, who actually had very high levels of qualifications who were in need of food because they couldn't work here in Canada w on those qualifications. So, sure. so credential recognition, uh, processing times, uh, family reunification, mm -hmm. super visa, these are some of the things that we're, we're, we're committing to as part of our platform. Sure. Um, and as you said, uh, you know, as I asked you earlier, that when the elections come closer, parties do lay out their agendas, they make promises. How is it, um, you know, that you are going to assure people that these promises will be met? Well, uh, you know, uh, we've, we've had six years of Liberal government. People mm -hmm. haven't followed through on their promises. I think Conservatives have a very good track record in, in previous governments of following through on their, on their prom promises. Sure. Uh, you know, and, and we will do everything we can to move our agenda forward. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's there. People can hold us accountable to that agenda. Um, you know, and, and I think you've got six years of, of a government breaking promises. Uh, give the Conservatives a shot at following through on these, uh, these bold and detailed commitments we've made. Uh, and I think people will really appreciate the, the outcomes, the results we're going to be able to achieve. Sure. Um, we, you know, Garnet, it has been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you and understanding uh, what Conservative Party has to offer. Um, and uh, since I mentioned that you've already served as a hu uh, human rights minister, so hearing out from you was definitely um, insightful. And thank you so much for coming to our studio and uh, doing this show with us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this was Garner Janis with us, uh, the MP Conservative from Edmonton. Uh, I hope you heard what the Conservative Party has to offer. Um, we hope that you know, these promises which are being made by the parties are met in future times. Whichever party comes in being or in power, we hope that uh, the Canadians as general are taken care of. Thank you very much. साडा हर एक प्रोग्राम देखण ते साडे नाल जुड़न ले सब्सक्राइब करो चैनल पंजाबी ते नोटिफिकेशन ले बेल आइकन वाले बटन ते क्लिक करो